Tracy and, and Josh and Bob, thank you so much for a wonderful introduction to this event. Uh, I always thought that the most difficult challenge for a scientist is to speak in front of the audience of colleagues and friends. Um, this challenge is probably aggravated by the fact that I have to speak about nutrition today, which is something I don't often do as a plant biologist. And the reason is because those colleagues and friends can occasionally catch you in a fast food joint next door <laughs> and realize that you're not practicing what you're really preaching. So, um, I'll today talk about one area of our work uh, in, in our group, which is just next door in Ferrand Hall, specifically about those paranutrients or whatever you call those compounds, which are outside the uh, dietary guidance, or they are not really have RDA for them, but yet still prove to be effective for human health. Tell you about what we do about them and how we go about studying them. And this group is polyphenols or main antioxidants in plants. So this is what I will focus uh, on today. But first, I of course want to remind you that uh, throughout our evolution as, as human beings, we always knew about the connection between food and medicine. And yet, Throughout our evolution, people have rarely actually selected plants for specifically for health benefits. And the reason, I think, is very simple. They almost never had enough to eat. So 10,000 years ago, when we first discovered agriculture, uh, we were just trying to find any plants from nature which we can grow and domesticate. Subsequently, I think the efforts of humanity were directed to just growing more and more food, which is basically just increasing yield and increasing productivity. And we have done remarkably well on this. We've done very little actually in, in studying the connection with health. Only at the end of the 19th century, when we started to understand which parts of our diet are essential for our survival, we started to dedicate some of our efforts to breeding for higher proteins, uh, for specific oils, then vitamins, of course, came into being. So we started actually adding nutrition component to what we do with our agriculture, what we do with plants. Uh, the only difference I'm actually aware of is, is psychoactive drugs, because certainly humanity have done quite a bit of breeding on opium puppy for the for years, uh, and possibly on marijuana, but not really on foods. What changed it all, at least in this country, that in the 90s we started seeing those boxes of Cheerios and, and Quaker uh, oats products and Kellogg, which started to directly link officially, and this was officially sanctioned by FDA, health and food. For example, with the claims, um, and those are qualified health claims, that for example, fiber can actually lower your cholesterol because sufficient amount of science has actually appeared to actually prove, for example, the link with fiber and lowering cholesterol. And that opened the, the Pandora gates uh, into this whole superfood uh, category and functional foods, poorly defined, sometimes poorly researched uh, foods. But clearly, we're now in a different stage where this connection between food and, and health is now being linked through a lot of science. And actually, NIH is now putting quite a bit of money on this, and we are fortunate to be beneficiary of this. And to change that. So we've spent, some of you, I've been here for a long time, spent quite a bit of time using plant phytochemicals actually to discover pharmaceuticals, to discover drugs. And still about a quarter of all the drugs which are prescribed now contain plant-derived phytoactives. actives. Uh, this has been very successful for the last 100 years. But the point I really want to make throughout this talk and what I believe in, and this is some prediction, that this era is over. Uh, pharmaceutical industry have moved to biologics, pharmaceutical industry. Uh, move to synthetic chemistry, combinatorial chemistry. I don't think it's coming back to looking for new phytochemicals, active phytochemicals from plants. I think the future of this area is going to be in health promoting phytochemicals and food. So this is really what we're doing. This is what we have funding from NIH, several grants to do it. Um, and um, this is what I'll be telling, talking to you about today. So, Specifically, again, going back to polyphenols and those antioxidants which are contained in fruits and vegetables, I think many of you here in the audience know better than I do that there's a lot of epidemiological studies and clinical studies which clearly link the consumption of fruit, 
fruits and vegetables with longevity and with the prevention of chronic diseases. Uh, this is just one of many studies. It's a very large one published in 2014 by Wang et al. Um, half a million participants where the mortality and disease load has been negatively related to actually amount of servings of, of fruits and vegetables people are consuming. So we know this link. So there's something going on beyond normal nutrition, beyond RDA, which is very important. So people started to ask question, what is that in fruits and vegetables, which actually may be responsible for this definitely, well, five recommended servings of fruits and vegetables today, which FDA recommends and we never actually follow. And I think that story starts, started the year I was born, 1956. Denham Harmon actually was the first one who published this article, which very few people read, but it's been very important, which actually stated and hypothesized that aging and chronic diseases are linked to the antioxidants in our foods. That gave rise to actually dietary supplement industry probably uh, 10 years later. So he said those are these antioxidants, which is basically in our language are polyphenols, which contain in foods actually scavenge free radicals, which do a lot of dam biological damage and, and, and cause this phenomenon of increasing basically longevity and, and health. And yet this hypothesis has never been fully uh, accepted because we actually lack the scientific evidence to connect uh, dietary antioxidants, polyphenols with this phenomenon. So FDA and NIH have been playing with this, but still at this point we're missing the direct proof that he was right. And of course, just this is what, what uh, we do. Uh, we have those polyphenols, those antioxidants, which obviously in addition to essential nutrients which are contained in, in fruits and vegetables, there's a major class of natural products which plants, fungi, and bacteria can actually synthesize. People are not very good at this. Animals don't, don't really make them well. Uh, their biochemical feature is they contain a benzene ring with several hydroxyl groups. Phenolics are just usually uh, a benzoic ring and have one uh, hydroxyl group. There's about 5,000 of them, many different classes, many different groups. Every plant I know makes them. Actually, I will show you one plant which didn't, doesn't, but that, that the one which was produced artificially. Uh, so those are those antioxidants. Those are what David Herman said, and this is what we, we this is the compounds. There's very few other really uh, large uh, group of compounds in plants which do this. Again, in other clinical studies, and some of them we've been marginally involved in, show directly, and I'm now focusing on polyphenols from berries, things like grape, which we are studying. Uh, again, there's been a lot of studies which suggest the link between the consumption of berry polyphenols, whether in isolated form or in form of like uh, berry purees and so forth, and particularly improvement in metabolic health, so and cardiovascular health and diabetes. These are the areas which have been prioritized. Again, uh, most of the studies has been positively linking those antioxidants with the prevention of uh, cardiovascular diseases and diabetes. And here is an issue, here is a dilemma, and this is what brought us into this area. Because, for example, if you look at berry polyphenols, which seem to provide all those health benefits, those compounds are not bioavailable. They're not even metabolizable in the gut. Most of them just pass through our system. So grapes and wine and French paradox and all these things, if you really look at, for example, grape or blueberry polyphenols, most of them are pro-anticyanidins, and there's some anticyanidins, which are the color pigments. 60% uh, of them, so in many cases 90% of them, will just pass through your system unperturbed and be excreted uh, in feces without ever really getting into your blood. So now the issue is, and really enigma is, how do those compounds really elicit those, those health benefits when they are just passed through you. And kicking and screaming, uh, this is how our lab was actually dragged into the microbiome area because this was a logical area to look at in the gut because those compounds stay in the gut. They don't really get much into the blood apart from some colonic metabolites, which are simple benzoic acid, which are unlikely to have those pharmacological effects. So uh, again, certainly I, I'm not the one who is going to tell you about the, the explosion of gut microbiome research in this world. But uh, our hypothesis, and uh, Professor Diana Rupchand uh, at this point joined the lab, 
our hypothesis was, let's see what's happening with, for example, gray polyphenols and they consume this part of the diet. Specifically, let's see whether we can detect some changes in gut microbiome and in the health of the intestinal lining and inflammation, this chronic, subchronic inflammation of intestinal lining, which seemed to be linked to the development of metabolic syndrome, like other sort of chronic uh, inflammatory processes. So that was just a logical place for us to look. Uh, well, the other issue, and this is a major issue in any kind of sort of nutritional research, is what do you really, now you're not working, you're not a pharmaceutical company, you're not working with single compound, which you can always standardize and measure. How do you actually standardize and, and try to administer those polyphenols in their native form? Because if you use harsh salt and if you extract, every time you extract something, your extract is different, which has been plaguing the clinical research um, in at least plant natural products. And how do you really don't introduce these harsh treatments with solvents, which can alter the content even before you start the experiment? And very briefly, the experiments I'll tell you in the next 10 minutes or so, we've utilized this very simple process, uh, which we call Nutrisorb process, which is uh, based on the natural ability of proteins to actually very effectively bind, sorb, and concentrate polyphenols. Invented almost the same age in agriculture was invented, 10,000 years ago. Then people learned that if you boil oak bark, for example, and then put the animal skills in it, the, the protein in skin will soften. And that's the reason is because the tannins, and leather tanning comes from, from that word, will bind to the protein very effectively and make them supple. So we said, well, is it possible uh, that actually we can bind polyphenols using edible proteins like soy protein? And as you can see from here, this is something again which Diana published on quite a bit. You can put soy protein in a grape juice, for example, this is concentrate, and all the colors and polyphenols will be bound. Basically, you create this protein particles coated with polyphenols, which then can be easily administered. And those polyphenols are the native state. You don't hydrolyze them because it's a very mild treatment. So, this is what we've uh, been administering in our studies. And again, we have published, and this is just one of the papers, uh, again, this is Diana's paper, where she showed, and that's something which actually been known before for blueberries, for example, but if you give polyphenols, except in our case, we gave this soy protein grape polyphenol complex, so concentrated, not altered really polyphenols for grape, we gave them to mice, and we see quite a bit of preventative effects in developing an actual curative effect on uh, high fat induced obesity uh, and insulin resistance in mice. Again, this has all been published, you've seen it, so I'm not gonna really focus on it. But clearly in confirming the results of other people, we've again seen that gray polyphenols will really prevent and protect against metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, at least in mice. So again, the question is, same phenomena, but how do they do that? And again, this brings us to gut microbiome. So we, at this point, got together with Peter Turnbaugh group, who was at Harvard, and now he moved to San Francisco. And we just basically uh, sent them, I think Diana sent him the, the cecum contents and the fecal samples of those mice, uh, fattened mice, fattened with Western high-fat diet. And he did this basically blindly analysis of, of changes in the microbiome, sent us the data, and they really said, wow, we have never seen such, such big changes occurring in the gut microbiome before. And particularly, this is grape polyphenols with soy protein. This is where basically our treatment is. He have observed a bloom in one particular gut micro microbe called acromantia, uh, which was very, very dramatic and has been actually uh, reproduced in many, many experiments which we have done with, with Diana have done. Um, you've probably seen this data before. Uh, the new data uh, has been on the fact that actually if you fractionate or you isolate the polyphenols from the grape uh, polyphenol complex, which you supply as Nutrisorb, as sort of expected, the least bioavailable parts of this uh, proantocyanidins, which are usually these big polymeric things, they were alone effective to, to reproduce the effects on the bloom of acromantia. And I'm not showing you, but actually anti-inflammatory changes in the gut wall, which was significant uh, with tight junction protein improvements and so forth. So dysbiosis was corrected, not only looking at the microbiome, but also looking at the markers in the intestinal cell walls. 
So, okay, great polyphenols do that. They cause dramatic changes in gut microbiome. They do it probably because of proantocyanidins. Uh, what does it all mean? How does it all work? And again, we went back to the literature, to the experts, and at that time, Lee Pink fortunately came here and gave us some really good advice on that. We started looking at Sacramentia, which we see the dramatic effect. And apparently, this is the only bacteria which has been directly linked to the prevention, through the intervention studies, actually, to the prevention of metabolic syndrome in animals. It's been linked by basically feeding the uh, Acromantia cultures, uh, dead or live Acromantia cultures to obese mice. It has been linked through actually recent studies by two groups where they isolated from the cell wall of Acromantia um, a protein, 1100 whatever protein, which by itself, when given to mice or injected, was proven to be highly uh, anti-diabetic. This is apparently a big area now. So here's maybe the link. It's the bloom of this acromantia, which is actually the anaerobic microorganism, which grows and feeds on the mucin right next to the intestinal wall. This is where it grows, and this is where we're seeing this bloom. So it's happening right next to the intestinal wall, and anaerobic bacteria benefits. Okay, we can possibly hypothesize the link with diabetes, but how do polyphenols do that? So it's a major class of compound. The only property which generally applicable to most of them is the antioxidant activity. David Herman, 60, 70 years of, of research without any hard proof. Um, so here is the hypothesis which we developed, and I'll show you what we have done to start proving it. When you have in your uh, diabetic uh, obese state, basically what is very well known, you have the dysbiosis in the gut. It's also very well known that actually if you have sterile animals, uh, no biotic animals which don't have gut microbiome, it's very hard to make them obese, diabetic, and insulin resistant. So it's been known for a while that there's some link between gut microbiome and metabolic syndrome, but what can it be? How can polyphenols affect them? So you have the state of dysbiosis, which is actually obvious in the uh, metabolic dysfunction of the epithelial wall associated with this phenomenon called leaky gut. This has been known for a long time. The junctions between epithelial cells become disrupted, so water, for example, can move in, but so can oxygen. So can oxygen from all the vasculature which really surrounds our, our, our intestine and our gut. Um, when you have oxygen, which, which can leak through this uh, because of the leaky gut syndrome, which is associated with dysbiosis and metabolic syndrome, probably you produce free radicals because this is what kills anaerobic bacteria. It's not oxygen, it's actually benign. It's the free radicals which are generated in biological systems, which no anaerobes can protect against. So the idea was um, then if you add your polyphenols to the system, okay, and now you have this oxygen diffusing freely, what they will do, they'll start scavenging free radicals. That will be particularly important for the area which is next to the cell wall because this is how oxygen moves in from this uh, tight junction, from the blood, same path as water moves in, okay? And, and then by scavenging free radicals, it will actually enhance the growth of anaerobic bacteria. It will selectively protect anaerobic microorganisms and that will lead to the reduction of oxygen diffusion and actually what we observe, normalization of the gut health and normalization of gut microbiome. How do we go around proving it? Well, the first thing which uh, actually Hital Hilaria, who is in the audience here, did a very simple experiment. Mice were actually uh, given our grape polyphenol um, protein complex, and all we looked at is the polyphenols and antioxidant capacity in their feces. And this is a graph, okay? This is the uh, food restricted stage, this is the fat stage. I mean, this is pretty clear proof that those things not only pass through the mouse, but they actually, you see a dramatic increase in antioxidant capacity in the feces, and you see actually increase if you measure polyphenols here, total polyphenols in both. It's really pretty dramatic data. So those compounds are in the gut, they are in the cecum, they are in the colon, and, and they are passing through. So how can we actually look at their direct effect? And this is where the imaging system which actually is available in Bush Campus came about, and, and Peter Kahn and others from our group, been looking into this and uh, studied to use fluorescent dye. And in the sign in green is a specific one which has been specifically developed 
is a very powerful uh, sort of reagent, reporter for the reactive oxygen species. And that's been used in, in usually in cellular systems, very rarely in vivo. So this is something which we added to this. Uh, and the property of undersigned in green is that uh, in the reduced state, uh, if you use to reduce it with sodium barohydrate, it doesn't fluoresce. But when it sees reactive oxygen species around, it becomes fluorescent, and you can actually see it. So what we've done first, we've just taken abyss mice, and we've taken a lean mice. We gavaged them with the dye in the reduced form, non-fluorescent, and they gave them grape polyphenols. And again, there was pretty dramatic results, which Peter observed. This is a fluorescence coming out of the gut of the abyss animals, indicating really reactive oxygen species presence, and this is the, the normal lean mice. You start spinning the animals, you get the integrated value over 360 turn, and if you measure the area under the curve, there's your fat animals, uh, and this is your lean animals, this is area under the curve. Pretty dramatic changes in redox potential and reactive oxygen species in the gut between lean and obese animals. So what happens if you add, give them grape polyphenols at the same time? This is just the overweight animals. Uh, gavaged, again spun around, and this is an area under the curve. This is your control. Okay, this is, uh, they continue to produce a lot of free radicals. You can quantify them. Grape polyphenols, proantisanidins, which are the actives in, in grape polyphenols, we know that. Again, dramatic reduction in fluorescence and free radicals. Beta carotene is the, and maybe I should ask some people in the audience here, but to my knowledge is another dietary, poorly bioavailable antioxidant, which we have, precursor vitamin A. It did the same thing. ALT is a mixture of more bioavailable, more metabolizable antioxidants like vitamin C and vitamin E, okay, which, which apparently would be absorbed or metabolized or degraded like vitamin C. Uh, well, we had very little effect with those. So those are your sort of more bioavailable, more uh, absorbable, uh, more degradable antioxidants. So that seems to fit. And also, if you do, even if you do it with the lean animals and you look at the fluorescence coming out of lean animals here, proantisanins, grape polyphenol, and again, this is your more bioavailable things, you do see similar kind of things at the lower level, but you still see that even in lean animals, you see further reduction in uh, reactive oxygen species in, in the gut. So, again, I, I by no means are going to try to convince you that actually we've produced a very convincing evidence that we now understand the link about non-bioavailable polyphenols um, from grape, for example, and metabolic health and, and microbial bloom. But we're continuing to work in this area quite actively. Um, and we, we do believe that it may be just the case that really those polyphenols, non-bioavailable, that change redox potential in the gut enough, scavenging free radicals, that they can actually favor the restoration of anaerobic bacteria, which seem to be mostly beneficial, like acromensia, um, and that may translate in improved metabolic health. All right. So let me just uh, move to the other part. Uh, uh, which also deals with polyphenols, but different polyphenols. Polyphenols from vegetables. Vegetables, in contrast to fruits and berries, have different types of polyphenols. They are low molecular weight, more bioavailable things. They're like things like quercetin, comferols, and all sorts of things. They're different. Vegetable polyphenols are more readily bioavailable. They, they can be detected systemically. The vegetables don't have too many proantisanidins, this and tannins, those big, big molecular weight compounds. Yet they've also been shown to be beneficial to human health in just as many studies that berry polyphenols have been. Well, our approach there was different. And, and uh, what we have decided is, let's just do something really interesting and novel. Let's take a vegetable, which is, we decided that vegetable is lettuce, which is not known for anything good or bad. It is only known that this is even the second or third most popular vegetable in the world. It's lettuce. It's sort of not much. You know, if you look, it doesn't really give you any, I mean, this is just some essential nutrients which we have selected. And yet everybody eat it. Lettuce can produce polyphenols, this low molecular weight uh, polyphenols, which, you know, quercetins, comferols, antisinins, which are beneficial for health. 
uh, but in amounts which apparently not the highest which 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 ever been recorded in animal and plant oh, sorry in plants uh, well it goes back to sort of yesterday's conversation we had over dinner we didn't want to use a GMO approaches to do it because whether you support or don't support GMO, it is something which will be at the end because of the regulatory requirement uh, to introduce GMO vegetables will be very, very difficult. We do know the pathway. We do know the genes of polyphenol biosynthesis and lettuce, but also many plants. So we've decided to go to sort of tissue culture selection approaches where we take a lettuce which already has high levels of polyphenols, which in this case are red lettuces. Uh, red is an indicator that the pathway is on break it down into individual cells. And the wonderful thing about plants, that every cell in the plant pretty much is a stem cell. You can regenerate a plant. Do a selection based on color in cells, and then take the darker cells and regenerate the plant back out of this. So you probably have heard that story. Natasha Pogrebniak, who worked in our lab, uh, and really a great tissue culture expert, uh, produced this uh, dark red lettuce, starting from already red lettuce with high polyphenols, but with even darker red lettuce, which we term Rutgers scarlet lettuce. And when we looked at this, and those are the three different sort of varieties we produced. We started with different parents. It's been quite a bit of work, tissue culture work. And uh, the data is quite remarkable. This is a uh, phenolics, well, total phenolics measured in those lettuces versus what is a gold standard sort of your antioxidant food, which is blueberry, right? Uh, and this is the ORAG, which is the measure of antioxidant activity, which, again, blueberry people have used to, to promote the blueberries as, as sort of this wonderful superfood because of antioxidants. Almost three times higher. Those are the lettuces which we have generated. Quite remarkable. Um, um, and uh, I just want to tell you, there are other very dark lettuces which are not really that much used commercially, but they also have high levels. We think that we, we did a little bit better than that. Now we understand that that we already took something which, which could have been found in nature and proved it just a little bit further. Then we've done a biochemical, of course, analysis to see which polyphenols are in there. And that was, again, a good news because those are all things that have been known uh, as, as good things for you. Uh, chlorogenic acids, of course, this is your main phenolic in coffee, for example. There's been a lot of recent studies on its effect for, from Alzheimer's to cardiovascular benefits. Quercetin derivatives and pigments, the cyanidins. So again, all those polyphenols been implemented in, in one or other improvements in human health, you know, maybe without very solid evidence behind them. We did actually fed uh, the Rutgers scarlet lettuce extract to uh, fed mice, and we did see that it improved glucose metabolism and insulin resistance. It's all been published. So there were some effects in animals as well, consistent with the presence of high uh, polyphenols. Again, this is something which have been known, it just has not been shown for, for this specific lettuce. And then, of course, there's a lot of interest. So uh, growers and, and seed companies came to us, and what they told us that, you know, uh, it's great, it's very nice, and we're going to start selling it and whatever, but people don't really buy dark red lettuces. Can you actually make a green high polyphenol lettuce? because people buy green lettuces. And this is, of course, the pathway, and this is the production of pigments is the last step in this phenylpropanoid pathway. And this is where, once in a lifetime, you just get lucky. <laughs> uh, it's not just science. Isabel Armas, who was a graduate student in the lab, she just planted lots and lots and lots of, of, of uh, our lettuces, dark red lettuces. And actually, we, we were able to isolate some absolutely green plants in the sea of this really dark red high polyphenol lettuces. Interesting part of them is that, that they were chimeric. They had these little dark red spots, very similar to transposable element system in corn, which has been so well described. Now we're seeing it in lettuce, but the lettuce is almost green. And if you grow in the right conditions, it's almost totally green. And it also has very high levels of polyphenols almost as high as, as uh, well, this is Rutgers scarlet lettuce. This is this green super lettuce, whatever. We don't know how to call those. We're not very good at this. And these are your blueberries. This is, was just luck. She just planted millions of seeds and found some natural variants there. We believe it's transposable element. Uh, Dr. Shanat Gurdon, who is now in the lab, actually is searching for the transposable elements. We're not quite there yet. 
But we now have a green lettuce and a red lettuce, which have exceedingly high amounts of these polyphenols and apparently tastes just, just very fine. If you go to your local so uh, stop and shop, I believe, or with this, yeah, I think that's where they sell it. It's actually now available. Uh, there are a couple of growers who are now growing it uh, under the license from Rutgers and us. Very aggressive, probably not appropriate label. Um, to my knowledge, we have some, uh, but you know, that's, and, and we told them so, but you actually antioxidant can all be uh, uh, compounds which have RDA in this, which is basically vitamin C, A, a and A, C, E, and A. But this is what they do, and this is now available, and they're scaling up the seed production. It's available in an aerosol spring mix, and it's available in a sort of this life plant, which is the mixture of our green and our red. Um, well, where do we go from here? And I'll stop soon. We said, fine, can we now take this system which we have and go further? Can we selectively induce the synthesis of most beneficial polyphenols which lettuce can make? Can we now produce the varieties with a specific polyphenols directed towards certain health conditions? Uh, knowing the, and we use the Ethyl, methyl sulfonate, which is this mutagen, this is not GMO approach, which actually will, will react with guan, guanine and that will cause basically the mismatch and so now you have uh, a point mutation in your genome. And we mutagenized lots and lots of dark red high polyphenol lettuces. And then we started selecting because again, if you introduce a mutation, one of the genes in polyphenol biosynthetic pathways, then because your color is the last step, you should be able to see it as green phenotype. One compound we were specifically interested in is comferol, because comferol, which is really not even present, it's very low amounts on lettuce, but it's been shown very powerful again on this, most of them as animal studies, anti-cancer, anti-diabetic effects. And Shanat Gurdon, who was in the lab at the time, who did all this work, he actually accelerated a number of green mutants from EMS mutagenized uh, high polyphenol Rutgers scarlet lettuces and, and some of its ancestors, and actually did identify the mutation. And one of the mutations which actually gave us this very high comferol lettuce, which has 1.2% one one comferol, it's usually not even detectable in lettuces, uh, was the mutation in the uh, consensus splicing site, so it could not accept the gene, which is actually this gene here, which uh, results in the production of comparol. The gene could not excise the intron correctly, uh, and so the pathway, the carbon flux pathway, have stopped here, and so you got the accumulation of comparol of about 1.2%. This plant is now also growing in, in the Rutgers greenhouse, has very high amount of comparol. This is just the literature survey we've done on other plants which, where comferol can even be detected. Um, and, and this is from the literature, right? So we are at least 10 times higher than anything which has been there. So now we have this high comferol lettuce, which doesn't produce any color, doesn't produce the downstream polyphenols, but has this compound which has actually been associated with health. One more mutant, the variant that Shanat has identified, was a mutant, chalconisomerase mutant, which actually blocks the pathway very, very early at the stage where you accumulate naringin and chalcon. And naringin and chalcon is really, the only other plant we were able to find, well, part of the plant where we found naringin and chalcon present is a tomato skin. Just skin of tomato for some reason has naringin and chalcon in it. Again, there was a uh, stop codon introduced into the gene, into the uh, chalconisomerase gene here, and led to accumulation of about 0.7% of dry weight of Norwegian chalcon. You go to the literature, plug it in Google, and you see all these things about anti-obesity and anti-diogenic and learning and memory effects of Norwegian and chalcon, which, again, literature is abundant with. So this added those two more lattices to sort of our collection of whatever, I don't want to call it nutritionally, whatever, it's paranutrients, because polyphenols obviously are not your nutrients. They are not essential at this point. We are have never proven that they're essential to our health. But again, this brings me back, sort of loops me back to this original message, which I believe where the research in plant phytochemicals will go into the future. 
I think we have passed the stage where we go to the savannas and, and tropical forests uh, to look for those new drugs from plants. I think pharmaceutical industry moved on. It's just not coming back to this bio bioprospecting paradigm. But I think the opportunities to actually influence the content of either nutrients or those paranutrients or biologically active, pharmacologically active compounds in foods, we're just at the dawn of this. And we're starting to understand that there's a lot of pharmacologically active compounds in what we eat. And if we understand what are the potential genetic uh, problems we might have when we grow up, we can actually use our diets, individualized diet. I know it's a, it's a context word which has, you know, some issues with that. So this is what we're trying to do. This is how we try to actually use our expertise in, in phytochemicals and bioactive phytochemicals to improve uh, human nutrition and to improve human health by, by developing either those botanical extracts like the microbiome altering uh, grape polyphenol mix, which seem to be very prebiotic and very active, to creating this new leafy vegetable varieties which have those pharmacologically active, hopefully beneficial compounds. So thank you very much. And, and I really, uh, I, I need to do this. Uh, I need to obviously acknowledge the people, mo many of them you know. Uh, Shanat Gurdon is lettuce work. Hital, uh, Kristen, Alex, who is really doing all our analytical work. Uh, David, uh, I don't have Diana anymore because she's now on her own, but she's sitting in the front row. Of course, she did a lot of microbiome work and, and Nutrisorb work. And two people who actually are no longer in the lab, but did the initial work with raptor scarlet lettuce and super green lettuce in our lab. Uh, this is Isabel Armas and Natasha Pogrebniak. And Peter is doing all our experiments with animals. So with that, thank you so much. <laughs>